Freaks and Geeks is a series that consistently appears on rankings of the greatest television shows of all time. Even though it was loved by critics and had a passionate fan base behind it, Freaks and Geeks was doomed from the start by a newly appointed network president at NBC who didn't share a creative vision with executive producer Judd Apatow and creator Paul Feig. As a result, the series was given an absolutely terrible airing schedule and was canceled after just one season. In today's video, we'll be discussing all things Freaks and Geeks, from its early development to its fight against executives at NBC and the legacy the show has built up over the years. This is a series that has definitely been discovered by fans in many different ways. Some were fortunate enough to have watched Freaks and Geeks on TV when it first aired. A lot of people caught it in the form of reruns when it received syndication or when it was released on DVD. And I'm guessing most people, myself included, discovered it on a streaming app of some kind. In 2012, the series was added to Netflix. And even though people told me that this was one of the best shows ever made, I was truly blown away when I watched it on there for the first time. Freaks and Geeks strikes a perfect balance between comedy and drama in a way that not many other series have been able to match. And it goes without saying that this series rocketed a bunch of its cast members into levels of success that many people couldn't have predicted when the show first aired. But Freaks and Geeks' story begins in 1997. The writer of the show's pilot episode and creator of the series was Paul Feig. His desire to write a high school-centric show stemmed from the fact that he had yet to see his own grade school experience represented properly in film or television. At that point, Paul was primarily an actor, but when his character was written off of Sabrina the Teenage Witch after its first season, offers for other acting roles began drying up. Yeah, bye bye. Uh, yes, uh, bye bye to all of you. <laughs> Luckily, Paul had aspirations of working behind the camera as a director, so he took some of the money that he earned while working on Sabrina and self funded an indie movie called Life Sold Separately. He had a lot of trouble promoting the movie, and because it was never officially released and only shown at a handful of college campus screenings, it's now considered lost media. But while he was out on the road touring the movie, Paul spent his spare time writing the spec script for Freaks and Geeks. Freaks and Geeks is set in a fictional town called Chippewa, Michigan, which is based on Paul Feig's hometown of Mount Clemens, Michigan. Even though the Midwest was used as a setting for a few TV series during the 90s, Paul felt that a lot of shows portrayed that region of the United States in a disparaging way. When he began writing the pilot episode of Freaks and Geeks, he wanted to be an advocate for the Midwest by portraying the area in a more positive light. Also, the Sam Weir character was almost entirely based on his life as a teenager. And like, I somebody threw a ball and I caught it, but out of just complete self-preservation. And then gym teacher's like, all right, there's no boundaries now. So then they could just stalk in and kill me. After completing the Freaks and Geeks pilot script in the later part of 1998, Paul passed it along to Judd Apatow. Judd and Paul met one another in the mid 80s when they were involved with the stand-up comedy scene in Los Angeles. Up to that point, their only on-screen collaborations were the Disney movie Heavyweights and the pilot episode of a show that Comedy Central aired one time but decided not to pick up called The TV Wheel. In 1998, Judd Apatow struck a deal with DreamWorks Television, and he told Paul that if he had any potential ideas for a TV series, he should send them his way. According to Judd, Paul never communicated with him about the script for Freaks and Geeks while he was writing it. He just sort of dumped it on him and hoped he would like it. Well, about 12 hours after Paul sent the Freaks and Geeks spec script his way, Judd called him and said, I love this. I'm going to have DreamWorks buy it. When Judd passed the script along to DreamWorks Television, their reaction was positive, but they knew that a show set around the year 1980 that took place in the Midwest would be a hard sell. Don't see that happening. Nowadays, this is hard to imagine because there are like a billion streaming apps available to us. But back in the late 90s, the big four, being NBC, CBS, ABC, and Fox, controlled the primetime television space. Freaks and Geeks was pitched to all of those networks, but the only one that showed interest was NBC. Carrie Burke and Shelley McCrory are the MVPs of the story. Because even though Freaks and Geeks didn't fit with the types of programming that NBC was known for in the late 90s, they thought the script was brilliant. And Shelley said to the development executives at DreamWorks, if we don't make this show, I'm quitting the television business. <laughs> Righteous. But NBC was in sort of a weird position during that time, because within a four-month period, the ratings juggernaut that was Seinfeld came to an end, and they also lost their broadcasting rights for NFL games. As a result, the network experienced a sharp decline in ratings, at which point Warren Littlefield, 
president of NBC Entertainment, stepped down from his position and was temporarily replaced by Scott Sassa. The Freaks and Geeks pilot script landed on Scott's desk while he was acting as the interim president for NBC Entertainment. And even though the show clearly differed from the programming that NBC was known for at that time, he loved it and gave the show his full support. Judd and Paul were told to proceed with shooting the pilot, and NBC didn't attempt to make any changes to the script. They loved it just as it was written. Going into casting for the pilot episode, Judd and Paul didn't want to cast TV kids. They wanted to cast real, relatable kids in this show. What are you losers doing on my street? Nothing. We're kind of here to beat you up. Bill! During the casting process for Freaks and Geeks, the main goal was to bring in unique characters and make slight changes to the pilot script based on their individual personalities. Even though NBC told the creatives on Freaks and Geeks that the script was fine, a lot of changes were made to that initial pilot script before filming started. For example, in the original script, when Lindsay confronts Alan for picking on her brother, instead of simply asking him to fight her, she just starts slapping the shit out of him. I think the Attitude Era audience of the late 90s would have loved to see that, but what are you gonna do? I don't know. What are you gonna do? Every one of the younger actors had a very limited amount of acting credits prior to being cast on the show. The only exceptions being Linda Cardellini and Jason Segel, who had pretty sizable resumes and even appeared as love interests in the 1998 comedy Dead Man on Campus. There were also a bunch of actors and actresses who auditioned for parts on the show, but either didn't land a role at all or were given a smaller part instead. Shia LaBeouf appeared on the show as a character named Herbert, but originally auditioned for the part of Neil Schweiber. Sam Levine ended up getting that role, and the circumstances leading up to his casting were just so unlikely. By the time I was 12, I w was doing stand-up comedy. Yeah. Lisa Kudrow, I know she told you to get an agent and start sure. auditioning. And yes, that's true. When I was uh, 12 years old, she saw me do stand-up at a friend's bar mitzvah, asked me if I was a professional. I said no. She's like, oh, you should consider it. I was like, okay, how do I do that? She's like, buy backstage. <laughs> There's, you'll find an agent. You'll, you'll, be and that's fine. what you did. And I literally bought backstage, and there was a manager advertising, "Are you a kid who does stand up?" So I called, and that's my rep who wound up years later submitting me for Freaks and Geeks. With casting out of the way, the pilot episode officially began filming in spring of 1999. The school used in the pilot and the rest of the series was the Ulysses S. Grant High School in Van Nuys, California which has been utilized as a filming location for dozens of movies, TV shows, and music videos. If you're watching something that takes place in a school and you see orange lockers in the background, there's a good chance that it was filmed there. Anyway, the cast and crew seemingly had a great time filming the pilot. And once the episode was sent to post-production, Judd and Paul knew that they had made something really special. Unfortunately, around that same time, a bunch of executive level changes occurred at NBC. Scott Sassa, the individual who championed Freaks and Geeks from the very beginning and gave it the support it needed to become a full-fledged TV show, was promoted and now acted as president of NBC's operations on the West Coast. His temporary position as president of NBC Entertainment was filled by Garth Ansier. Garth Ansier previously worked for the WB, where he helped put series like Seventh Heaven and Dawson's Creek on the air. In other words, the shows that Freaks and Geeks aimed to differentiate itself from. What is that? It's you, you freak! Oh, my ass I was relaxed while I was sleeping. Oh. God, God, it's so disgusting! I so it's no surprise that, unlike Scott Sassa, Garth Ansier didn't like or understand the appeal of the Freaks and Geeks pilot when it was presented to him. Nonetheless, in May of 1999, NBC decided to greenlight the show for an additional 12 episodes. The show was also given an official premiere date, September 25th, 1999. Well, more importantly, Saturday. September 25th, 1999. The creatives on Freaks and Geeks immediately thought to themselves, there's no way that our target audience, teenagers and young adults, are going to be at home watching TV on a Saturday night. But they figured that if the show received enough praise from critics and general buzz from TV viewing audiences, maybe NBC would move the show to a better time slot on a different day. Production resumed in August of 1999, so the cast and crew were on location filming the show when critic reviews started pouring in for the pilot episode on September 24th. 
Every review that I was able to locate from that time seemed to share the opinion that this was a solid series premiere, but the time slot that NBC gave to the show made absolutely no sense. This writer for the Boston Phoenix even asked the question, how big a loser do you have to be to watch network TV on a Saturday night? When the cast and crew returned to set on the Monday that followed the series premiere, Paul Feig stood up on a table and proudly read the debut episode's viewership ratings out loud. Freaks and Geeks, with a Saturday night premiere, had an average viewership number of 9.17 million and was ranked number 65 out of 116. On a Thursday night in 1999, that would not be a great number. But on a Saturday night in 1999, when most people were probably out spending their Saturday night at an Eiffel 65 concert, or enjoying some fine cuisine at the Rainforest Cafe, those are some really solid numbers. But for the week of September 27th to October 3rd, when the second episode titled Beers and Weirs aired, Freaks and Geeks fell to the 96th spot with an average viewership of 5.58 million. A drop in viewership between the debut episode of a new series and its follow-up episode isn't uncommon, but losing nearly half of your viewing audience between the first and second episode is a completely different story. As the creator of the show, Paul Feig had access to minute-by-minute -minute viewership statistics, and he shared that during the pilot episode, when Lindsay attempts to defend the mentally challenged character named Eli while he's being teased by his peers, right after he gets upset, trips, and breaks his arm, like, half of the viewing audience changed the channel or turned off their TVs. Over the years, I've gone back and rewatched Freaks Geeks from start to finish, I don't know, 10 times, and I'll admit, that scene always makes me cringe a bit, but clearly the show isn't making fun of Eli. And if the people who tuned out had actually stuck around for the end of the episode, they would have known that this moment is completely redeemed during the homecoming dance scene that caps off the episode. The massive drop in viewership ratings between the first and second episode definitely didn't help the show's cause, but Freaks and Geeks was temporarily removed from NBC's Saturday Night lineup in favor of postseason baseball until October 30th, 1999. So that means the show was on for only two weeks, followed by a four-week break. Hey man, that's not cool. Episode four, titled Kim Kelly is My Friend, was supposed to air on November 13th of that year. But it was the first episode of the series that NBC refused to show because they believed that the subject matter was too dark. In a span of 45 minutes, this episode covered child abuse, domestic abuse, and bullying. The subject matter and the performances that the actors gave to this episode were definitely pretty heavy for network TV at that time. Judd Apatow apparently battled with the network over creative differences on pretty much a daily basis. Garth Ancier at NBC constantly told the creatives on the show to give the characters more victories. Because to him, it seemed like every episode was too sad. They even suggested casting culturally relevant individuals on the show. No way! No. Boo! Boo. For example, they wanted Britney Spears to play a waitress in an episode. Which episode, I'm not sure, but if it's the one where the geeks dine out at a steakhouse, that would be hilarious because the waiter is played by David Koechner, and he's just about the polar opposite of Britney Spears. Heading into the year 2000, in a too little too late effort by NBC, Freaks and Geeks was moved from Saturday to Monday nights at 8pm. It was around this time that the network approved an additional 5 episodes, for a total of 18. With its new time slot, the show was doing slightly better than before, but it's no surprise that because the audience the show aimed for, teenagers, probably never saw the first few episodes to begin with, they still weren't tuning in. So NBC paused the show once again, this time for over a month. They aired two more episodes, and since they were still underperforming, NBC decided to finally pull the plug on Freaks and Geeks by announcing its cancellation in March of 2000. At that point, NBC gave Judd Apatow and DreamWorks Television permission to shop the show around at other networks. The only network that came close to picking up the series was MTV, but they wouldn't have been able to give it the same budget that NBC did, so the quality of the show would have taken a hit. At that point, Judd and Paul agreed that they would rather just let the series go out on a high note. Before letting go of the series entirely, NBC agreed to air the final three episodes of Freaks and Geeks in a one-night marathon on July 8th, 2000. Two days later, it was reported that the series was picked up by the Fox Family Channel. On the downside, they weren't picking it up for a new season. This was just a syndication deal. But Fox Family aired the series more consistently, which introduced it to a new audience, and established fans were finally able to watch the episode that I spoke about earlier, Kim Kelly's My Friend, along with episode 14, Dead Dogs and Gym Teachers, and episode 15, Noshing and Moshing, which also never aired on NBC because they were considered too dark. 
Garth Ansier was let go from NBC just a few months later, and he has since stated that canceling Freaks and Geeks has haunted him forever. It's funny because I found this article from when Garth was appointed to NBC, and the writer of the article said, The network has suffered ratings losses as of late and has been criticized for weak, redundant programming, particularly sitcoms. It kind of sounds like propping up Freaks and Geeks with a solid primetime schedule and promoting it extensively would have been the answer to that problem. To be fair, NBC did sort of promote the show. They ran these really cheesy commercials that didn't reflect the tone of the series correctly. This fall, travel back to a simpler time of life. 1980, and you find yourself in school. 1980, wishing that you were more cool. 1980, oh, no! No way. And they would also have the cast members appear on other programs, such as Family Feud and the Macy's Thanksgiving Day Parade but clearly it wasn't enough. Even though the show was abruptly canceled, Judd Apatow essentially made it his mission to bring back cast members from this show in a bunch of his future projects. So the series sort of lives on in that way. It seems like every time one of the actors or creatives from this show sits down for an interview, they're questioned about a possible revival. Seth Rogen recently responded to the question with, it's so rare that you do something in your career that is actually just viewed as good. I know enough now not to fuck with that, to just let it be good and not try to go and revisit it. Just let it exist. Also, James Franco let it be known that he's probably never going to work with Seth Rogen again after, well, everything that surfaced about him a few years back. On one hand, it sucks that this show only had one season, but at the same time, Freaks and Geeks never had the chance to go downhill. In an interview that was published shortly after the show's cancellation in 2000, Sam Levine was quoted as saying, It doesn't matter if it's 1950 or 1980 or 2000. Kids still deal with the same things, and I think we really nailed that. This quote was right on the money, because 23 years after he made that statement, it still rings true. Freaks and Geeks doesn't need to be revived or rebooted. Just give the fans a little nod to the show from time to time, or reunite the characters in a Dungeons & Dragons promotional video. That's all we need. But that'll do it for today's episode. I hope you enjoyed it. If this video does well, I'll definitely make another episode about Undeclared, which was sort of a spiritual successor to Freaks and Geeks. As always, thank you for watching, and I'll see you on the next one.